market because we are there. <laughs> we're, we're in Canada. I grew up in the US and worked there clinically. But I thought I would just show you a few quick statistics. I'll move through these quickly. Um, you have two groups of professionals in North America, particularly in the US, that actually deal with hearing aids. So audiologists don't just dispense hearing aid audiologists. A lot of them even don't touch hearing aids. They focus more on the diagnostic side of things. But you have a second group called hearing aid dispensers. And if you look at the educational requirements, you see they vary quite a lot. I have a doctorate in audiology, and yet somebody else who's selling the same hearing aid down the street may have a high school diploma and a few hours of on-the-job training, depending on the state, and may still be licensed to dispense hearing aids. And so this has been a huge chasm. My whole career is dealing with the fact that I have um, years and years of education, and somebody else down the street may be perceived as being equivalent to me because they're selling the same product. Again, as a company that produces hearing solutions, we have to actually address both of those because they are both our customers. And as a trainer or as a professional who's trying to figure out how to educate people about our products, I have to figure out how to present that technology in a way that can be digested and used and useful by quite disparate groups of professionals just within North America. And of course, when you get to countries where they don't have any training at all, it can be even more of a challenge. So, uh, hearing healthcare as a profession has quite a lot of variability and quite a few interesting overlaps and challenges and evolutions that are going on. Um, and ultimately in the U.S., it's your state license that determines whether you can practice or not, not actually your degree. It doesn't matter what degree you have, if you don't have a license in that state, you can't practice. And what determines whether you can get a license or not is, is a state-specific thing. I think it's similar regionally in uh, Canada, I'm not too sure. I'm, I'm new to Canada, so I don't know all that regulatory stuff yet. Anyway, let's move on. I just, I don't know why those are the symbols, but I think I, I put those there to show tension between the two groups because it's still quite a, ten, a ten, uh, tenuous relationship. If you go to an audiology conference in the U.S., you will very, very meet a hearing, uh, hearing aid dispenser. And the conferences that tailor to hearing aid dispensers, the only audiologists there are the PhDs who come to speak. No self-respecting audiologist in clinical practice would ever go to a dispenser's meeting. I'm exaggerating a little, but it's almost that extreme. So the chasm between the two is huge, and yet they still have to find ways to work together and collaborate at times. So anyway, uh, this I'm not going to get into the statistics too much, but I just wanted to let you see how things have changed over the years. So this is the percentage of hearing aids that were fit by audiologists as first hearing aid spe specialists or participants, and then you got physicians down there as well. But what you can see here is back in 1984, it was mostly hearing specialists and very few audiologists. And this was as of 2000, so this is already almost 20 years old. It was up to 63% audiologists versus 31% dispensers. So audiologists really have started to dominate the profession. And that's a big shift because in the 70s, audiologists were not even permitted to dispense on high hearing aids. They would do all of the diagnostic work and then have to refer on to a dispenser for the purchase of hearing aids. And finally, in the 70s, that started to shift. So that was kind of an interesting thing, and I think it was similar here. Again, professional certification, you can see a fairly even split there between um, doctors of audiology, which is the degree I have hearing specialist, but then if you include the master level audiologists, you have a bigger group with audiological training versus those that don't. But you still have a large group of prof professionals <laughs> with very little actual formal education. Um, and this was an interesting one, I thought, just because, it, I don't know what year this was, this was probably also around 2000, it was about a 50-50 split, male to female. I would say that's shifted much more heavily towards female. And depending on the country you're in, it can be very much more so, but not always. You go to the UK, you still have a lot of male audiologists. You go to South Africa, you have 95% female. Um, the US is probably, I'm guessing now, is more like 65 female, maybe higher. But you go to Serbia, and you may have almost exclusively males. So depending on the country you're in again, it can vary dramatically. Um, I became an audiologist uh, after studying psychology first. And my undergrad degree was in psych, and I decided I wanted to do something a little more concrete, but in a healthy profession, and I kind of landed in audiology. Became an audiologist with a master's degree, and then updated, upgraded to a clinical doctorate through a distance education program in two, between 2001 and 2003. Um, this was a picture of me my first year in clinical practice in Billings, Montana. I uh, was posing for that picture, but that was one actual real patients. And uh, I, sometimes I 
everything I, in my mind I still want to say. <laughs> 24 years ago, when Peter earlier talked about being almost a quarter century, I didn't really like that. I much prefer to say for a little over 20 years, which to me sounds somehow nicer than almost a quarter century. Um, but I guess reality bites, right? Um, I, my first four years I worked in a multi, excuse me, in a private practice setting. This was my mentor. He hired me out of grad school. I did my clinical fellowship with him, and for four years, I worked in a whole variety of settings. My first job was actually traveling to rural schools in Montana and actually testing kids and following up on kids in school. And then eventually I started doing more diagnostic work in a clinical office and started doing hearing aids and moved on from there to several other things. After four years in that private practice setting, I moved over to a multi-specialty clinic hospital setting where I got a lot more involved in diagnostics, particularly with children. I did a lot of pediatrics. Montana doesn't have a dedicated pediatric hospital. Our facility was a referral center for pediatrics, so about 25% of my case work was for kids. I helped set up the newborn hearing screening program. How many, how many of you have children that have been born in the last 10 years? Do you remember your child being screened, hearing screening? That was new when I was first started to work at this job, and I actually was able to help set up the uh, regulatory agency and the program and everything in Montana that actually mandated and got the process rolling for children hearing screening. By the way, you can test the child's hearing within a few hours of birth. Peter's done that. We can talk about how that's done another time. And then I did dispense hundreds of hearing aids over the years, so I was our customer. And I even did some guest lecturing. So after 12 years of that, well, that's the picture from Montana, not actually in Billings. So that's up in Waterford National Park, which is, or on the Glacier National Park, which is just across the Canadian border from Waterford. But that was in Montana. So after 12 years working in clinical practice, I thought, hmm, is there something else to see and do out there? And I took the chance to move to Switzerland where our corporate Sonova headquarters are, I started working as an audiologist in the marketing department. Let me tell you, that was a shock to the system. Not just moving to Switzerland, that was culturally different, but going from clinical practice, working in the marketing 